Amen. You may be seated. I, I, I feel awkward not following the Dust of Glory intro video. It's like, you know, shouldn't should we be in Dust of Glory? But, but you know, Dust of Glory played a huge part in the growth of our church, I believe, and numerically, but even more so spiritually. Can I have an amen? I, I just, I, I believe so many. I, even since we're done, I've had people in the community come and say, Pastor, I hate it's over. And I'm like, well, I'm glad you do, but I'm, 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 it's, it's, it's played its part, so... Uh, if you're a first-time guest and you're watching for the first time, thank you for tuning in. But if you're here physically, like, it's such a nasty day. Wow. But I'm so glad you're here. And I used to, and I've said this before, I used to hate rainy days. But here's the truth. Whoever wants to be here is, is going to be here, correct? And there's just something that makes worship so powerful when you get a bunch of people who want to be here who want to worship Jesus. So even though it's rainy and nasty and it hadn't rained in four months and the last two Sundays it's poured, hey, we just thank God for the rain and move on, Right? Tell you guys, thank you for being here. And, and we are done with Dust of Glory. And I'm going to really start pushing you. In 2024, I believe we could be a church of 4,000 very quickly. And here's what I mean by that. Our kid point is so good. Our students are so good. Our worship are, is so good. Our, our life. And if I just back off a little bit, guys, I can't. I'm going to push you harder than I ever have in 2024. Why? Because I believe there's so many people who think they've had an encounter with God, but they've never had a true encounter with God. You'll say, you'll say that, you know, I got changed by Christ, but it doesn't seem like as if there's any change in you whatsoever besides just maybe checking the box. There's still a lot of religion in the American church and in our church, and I want it to turn into a radical love relationship that produces life change in a way like we've never seen before. And that's kind of what Christmas at Five Point is about this week and next week. It's just about life change. Let me see him. Got my Bible, Pastor. Got my Bible, got my Bible. Good job, good job, good job. First time guest, you don't have a Bible, just re read with us. But go to Connections and get one. Now, because I'm not in a certain book, and then, you know, just making my way through the Bible like I have been, we're going to have to change some from spot to spot as we move forward this year. So take your Bibles, turn to Luke, and we're going to be in the four Gospels here, there, a little bit everywhere as we make our way looking at some incredible encounters with Jesus. How many of you have ever seen the movie A Christmas Carol? Christmas classic. Who's the star of the movie? Scrooge. Scrooge. And, and Scrooge hates Christmas. Do, do you know why he hates Christmas so badly? A couple of reasons. One, he had terrible, terrible Christmases with his family, so it makes him hate Christmas. His fiance dropped him during Christmas because he got so tight. His good friend died during Christmas. But then the number one reason was that he saw people wasting so much money, and money was his thing, and then he hated Christmas because of it. My family sitting over here say, Dad, you're like Scrooge during Christmas. And it's where we get bah humbug. And it's like, it's, it's so, you're so bah humbug about Christmas. And, and here's the truth. They don't cut me any slack whatsoever. But I don't hate Christmas. If you're a child of God and you've been encountered, I mean, you've truly had an encounter with Christ, how could you hate Christmas? Because Christmas is what allowed us, because of the birth to have our salvation. Someone say amen. amen. Okay, okay. But the thing that I hate about Christmas is what we've allowed it to turn into. We have taken what should be a sacred holiday for the church, and we've allowed the world to help brainwash us to celebrate it the same way the world does. Come on, church, is that a fair statement? Let me show you what I mean. Now, this isn't from some statistics. This is just from your pastor's heart of what happens here at Five Point Church. Every late November to December, we see church attendance drop. It just, it starts dropping. Why? Well, because, you know, we get so busy doing all of our parties and our shopping and, you know, weather might be a little bit different, you know, rains. Church attendance drops, just the facts after doing this 20 years. Continue. We see giving drop. That doesn't take a rocket scientist. Why does giving drop during November and December? Got to buy presents for who? Oh, well, we ain't going to buy them for, you know, why would we give to Jesus? We got to buy for everybody else. Number three. Bring the Bible, stop, drops. This November and December, I've even said it out loud. Come on, guys. Man, it's, it's like our, our, our spending time with God during Christmas drops 
because we're so busy doing all the worldly things. Come on, church. Is that fair? Continue. We see that stress and tension rise. Instead of joy appearing during Christmas, why do we who claim to be children of God allow stress to rise? Well, it's because, you know, we got all these parties and, and all these things that we have to do. Number five, we see credit card usage soar. And when the credit card usage in November, December soars, then come January, we got to start paying for it. And that's when it really starts buckling down. And then we see that very little said about Christmas from people who claim to be children of God. We get so busy with our shopping, our parties, our bowl games, just the busyness. And let's not forget those elves on the shelves. And those things take a lot of time, right? It's like we, the church, have forgot what Christmas is supposed to be all about. That's why Christmas doesn't excite me like it used to. But what if, what if, what if, just think, just, just imagine with me, think if every late November to December, we began to see that church attendance skyrocketed because people say, man, what you so jolly about? What you so happy about? Man, I get to worship the King of Kings during his birthday season. What if attendance started going up? What, what if we began to see, number two, we began to see giving be unbelievable. Then instead of giving so much to the world that we gave to Christ, come on, come on. What, if, what if we began to see that every day people couldn't help but get in the Bible, no matter how busy they were, because they just want to spend time with Christ, especially during his birthday? Because don't you want to spend time with the ones you love during their birthday? What if stress and tension began to just disappear because we don't allow the circumstances of our life to dictate us, we allow Christ to dictate our circumstances? No, 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 we're all stressful and tense. No. What, 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 if, what if we began to see credit cards just cut in half? I don't have to buy for everybody. And then what if Christians spoke about the birth of Christ, who he was, what he was, and what he had done every day? Now, I'm not talking about you going, you know, wear your Turner Burn t-shirt and go beat someone across the head. It just started bringing up Jesus in everyday conversations. And here's the truth. Here's the truth. We've got so many people in the American church, including Five Point, that you've checked that box. Tick. You know, I, I got saved. I get to go to heaven. And now I'm just going to live like the world. That is called religion. When you've truly experienced Christ, when you have encountered Christ, your life is radically changed. Come on, man. Am I right, church? So what I want to do this morning and next week is we're just going to look at some life-changing encounters that people had in the Bible. And here's the truth. Here's the truth. When you have encountered Christ in a great way, your life is going to be changed. You're not going to look the same or walk the same or look like the world like so many so-called Christians do today in the American church. Take your Bibles, turn to Luke. I want to start with a story that you're probably familiar with. It's a woman, a very sinful woman. And Jesus is with a bunch of the religious elite, you know, those Pharisees, Sadducees. He's, he's with a bunch of religious elite, and he's having dinner. And while he's having dinner, this very sinful woman comes and begins to wash his feet. Take your Bibles, turn to Luke. Luke 7, we're having this dinner, all these religious elite people, you know, those really self-righteous religious people are around the table, and this woman comes in, and make sure you catch the context. A woman didn't just come in off the street with a bunch of men. It didn't happen that day, but she didn't care what people thought. She came right in amongst all of those very highfalutin religious people, Luke 7, verse 37, and behold, a woman in the city who was a sinner. When she learned that he was reclining at the table in the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster flask of anointment. You know, it doesn't tell us this, but she probably didn't have the money to bring this. And standing behind him at his feet, weeping, 
She began to wet his feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with the anointment. Oh, come on, Pastor. That's, 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 that's taking it a little far, isn't it? I mean, do you, this isn't a parable. This, is a, this, this happened. Don't you think that's a little extreme, you know, falling at the feet of Jesus and weeping to the point that you wet his feet with your tears and put really expensive perfume and, and then take your hair and dry it? That's a little extreme, isn't it? That's exactly what the religious elite thought. Look, look what verse 39 says. Now, when the Pharisees who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, if he claimed to be who he said he was, he would have known who and what sort of woman this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner. Oh, my goodness. Does it not sound like American church people? Well, let's, let's talk. Let's talk. Oh, my. What are they doing here? Can you believe their sins. Isn't it amazing how we will compare our sins to others to make ourselves feel better instead of comparing our sins to Christ? In 2023, I don't know why, I guess just Holy Spirit, I guess. Christ has really been hammering a certain section of Scripture on me. And my desire in 2024, more so ever in my life, is for 1 Corinthians 11 to come, 1 Corinthians 11 and 1 to come alive in my life. And the Apostle Paul says, imitate me as I imitate Christ. In other words, you want to see what Jesus looks like? You want to see the perfect representation of Jesus? Follow me. That means when you're shopping, when you're at home, when you're aggravated with your spouse, when you're aggravated with your kids, when you're aggravated at work, when you're aggravated with that person in the left lane going slow for no reason whatsoever, (laughs) imitate me as I imitate Christ. And so... I think this is where a self-righteous church people mess up. We start comparing ourselves to the, you know, that, that sinful woman who's washing his feet. I think the verse for 2024 that I've memorized and I'm going to really place in my heart is Matthew 7, 3 through 5. And I want you to read this with me. Why do you see the speck that's in your brother's eye, but do not even notice the log that's in your own eye? You want to fix their sin but you don't want to deal with your own sin. You want to compare your sin to their sin instead of the perfection of Christ himself. Why do you see their sin and you can't even see your own, Christ said? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye. Let me fix you. Let me take care of your problems because they're so much worse than my problems. Let me take the speck out of your eye when there is the log in your own eye. Do you hear what Christ is saying, church? Come on. Come on. Let's keep going. You hypocrite. First take the log out of your own eye, then you'll see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. In other words, why don't you try dealing with your sin before you start trying to fix everybody else's sin? When you get up of a morning, you're just like me. You look into the mirror and there's the biggest problems in your life. But yet we don't want to say that. We want to make fun of those, come on, come on, sinful people. And that's exactly what's happening at this dinner. If they knew who that was, if Jesus knew, he would not allow her to touch him. Christ knew exactly what that religious, self-righteous person was thinking. So he said, hey, Peter, let me ask you something. Yes, sir. There's a money lender, and he, he lent $50 to a man, and then he loaned $500 to another man, and neither one could pay their debt. So he, he canceled their debt. Peter, who do you say would be the most grateful? And Peter said, well, you know, kind of obviously the, the one with the 500 Good, good. Luke 7, verse 44, let's pick up the story. Then turning toward the woman, you can hear Jesus kind of telling that story of the money lender while she is at his feet weeping, just washing his hair, washing his feet with her tears. He said, then turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, do you see this woman? You, 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 You can actually see Jesus. Do you see her? You guys are talking about her, but look what she's doing. Do you see this woman? I entered your house and you gave me no water for my feet, but she has wet my feet with her tears. And then she wiped them with her hair. A woman's crown. 
And you gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she's anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore, I tell you, listen, her sins, which are many, are forgiven. For she loved much, but he who is forgiven little loves little. That is so us. Well, you know, I'm, I'm not that kind of sinner. You know what I mean? I'm not a hooker. I don't do drugs. You know, I didn't rob a bank. I didn't murder anybody. So, you know, why would I want to bow down and worship Christ at his feet? A bunch of self-righteous church people. Because of the gift of salvation and of our sin being forgiven. And here's the truth. It seems as if once so many American church people get saved, we don't even ask Christ to forgive our sins anymore because we don't think we're that big a sinner. You don't fall at the feet of Jesus and beg him for the forgiveness of your sin because you don't think that your sin's that big a deal. But just self-righteous church people that we've become. She had an encounter with Jesus to the point she fell at his feet and wept because of the forgiveness that he gave her. That's an encounter with Christ. What does your encounter with Christ look like? What were you before that encounter? And what do you look like after that encounter? And for the majority of us in this room, come on church, ain't a whole lot changed, but I get to go to heaven. Another encounter. Here's a map where that Jesus in Jerusalem made his way up to the Sea of Galilee often. And I've taught you this so many times. And they would make their way up the Jordan River because that's where water was. And they stayed away from that city called Samaria. Why? Because it was full of Samaritans. What's, what's a Samaritan? It's a half-breed. It's when a, a Jewish person had a child with someone who wasn't. So now they're a half-breed. What, what is a Gentile? A Gentile is someone who had zero Jewish blood in them. The Jews hated them. Hated Samaritans and Gentiles. Because they weren't the chosen people. <laughs> They're not the, you know, church folk. And so Jesus stops in Samaria and he stops at a well in the middle of the day. And he tells the disciples, go get something to eat. And you, and you, you, when we've, we've talked about this, guys. So this woman comes out in the middle of the day with a jar to get water. What is a woman doing in the middle of the day when it's the heat? It's because she can't come in the morning. Why? Well, you know, she's a sinner she's had all those husbands and she's shacking up with another man now and you know us good religious people we couldn't dare be around a woman like that because she's unclean she's unclean stay away from us she shows up at the well and Jesus just starts a conversation with her hey how about some water and you can see the way, the progression. Oh, I know who you are. You're a Jew. Oh, I know who you are. You're, you're okay, okay. You're a prophet. My goodness, you're the Messiah. So what does she do? She runs and joins a Bible study. She runs and goes to church on Christmas and Easter. She runs, no, no, no. She goes and tells everybody that she's met the Messiah. John 4, verse 39. You're in Luke. Flip over to John. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, verse 4, I mean chapter 4, verse 39. She runs and tells the people, he's here. Who? The Messiah, the one we've been looking for. Oh, he is. You know, I'm telling you, he's here. John 4, verse 39. Many Samaritans from that town believed in him. Listen, listen. Because of how great that church was. Because they watched something on the internet. Because of that. No, no, no. Why did many of the Samaritans believe? Come on, church. Because of this woman's testimony. She didn't know anything about the Bible. She'd never been to a Bible study. She hadn't gone through dust of glory. She hadn't been through. All she knew was this. She had encountered Jesus, and she wanted others to encounter him the same way. Your testimony is the greatest gift you have. This is what I was before Christ. This is how I encountered Christ, and this is what I look like after Christ. But we don't want to talk about him. We're too busy. Come on now. Shopping. Hustle and bustle, parties, work, kid stuff, this, and a lost and dying world is going straight to hell. But this woman encountered Jesus in a great way. Keep going. 
because of this woman's testimony, and he told them all that I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them, and he stayed for two days, and many more believed because of his word. She had an encounter with Christ and immediately just wanted to tell everybody. How is it that 99% of the American church has never led one person to Jesus? So we saw a woman, because of her sin, washed his feet. Because she was so broken and thankful for her sin. We see a woman that nobody would hell you around. You know, all them self-righteous people ain't going to hang out with her. And she told the entire city. Now I want to look at a man. And in that day, and you, you, a lot of you know this, certain people were literally considered what I called scum of the earth. And who were those people? Tax collectors. Why? Because they were collecting taxes for the Romans. And let's say you owed two denarii. They'd say four denarii. And there'd be two Roman soldiers standing there and there's nothing you could do. And you'd have to take those, that you'd have to give those other two. What did the t- tax collector do with those other two? Kept them himself. Put them in his pocket. So they hated tax collectors. Well, Jesus was coming into town and this little short guy, what's his name? You know him. Zacchaeus. He says, man, I just want to hear about this, Jesus. And, and, and the roads were crowded. We're going to turn back to Luke again. We're going to go to Luke 19. And the roads were crowded. And, and as they're coming in, people are wanting to see. And you know what? Just so frustrating about this. The people weren't lining the streets because they wanted to see the Messiah. They're lining the streets because they want to see the magic show. We want to see more people get fed. We want to see people rise from the dead. We want to see the lame walk. We want to see the blind see. Just show us some of your stuff. We don't really want to, you know, fall radically in love with you. We just want to receive the blessings you have. Hey, I just want to go to heaven. I want health, wealth, and prosperity. But don't you ask me to be radically changed by who you are. So he has climbed up that tree and Jesus walking by says, Oh, come down. I'm having dinner with you tonight. Luke 19, verse 6, says this. So he hurried and came down and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they all grumbled. Here we go again. A bunch of self-righteous church people. He's a tax collector. Yeah, he is. Have you noticed how Jesus just flocks to the sinners and not so much the saints? Wow. Wow. And when they saw it, they grumbled. He's gone into the guest of a man who's a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. Why would Zacchaeus say, I'll give him half of my goods? Because he had bought those with what? Stolen money. In other words, listen, listen. He was wanting to right his wrongs. Have you encountered Christ to that point? You know you owe that person an apology. You know you owe this person this amount of money. You know, you know. But this is what we do as church folk. We ask God to forgive us in private, but we don't go out in public and try to confess it or make the changes that are necessary. It's all about that private, you know, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. No, Zacchaeus said, I'll right my wrongs. And it wasn't because he had to. Come on, it was because he wanted to. He said... Look, the half of my goods I give to the poor, and if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it. Say it with me. I restore it fourfold. Have you encountered Christ in such a way that you want to right the wrongs before Christ? Or has it been, I got saved, I'm good, let me move forward? I saw this woman that was so broken over her sin that she washed his feet. Pastor, that's a little extreme, is it? Then you saw another woman that once she did fall radically in love, when she was, had this encounter, she went and told the whole city who he was. Then you see a man who was hated by everyone encountered Jesus and said, I will give back to anyone and then I'll even fourfold it if I need to. That's life change. Have you ever encountered Jesus to that way? Or did you just check the box? I got saved. And now I'm going to live just like the world, and that includes the way that I celebrate Christmas. I want to look at a little different style life change here. It's one that so many of the American church folk would be, you know, 
really be able to kind of resemble because it's just the way your encounter went. Take your Bibles, turn to Matthew. You're in Luke, just flip over a little bit to Matthew 27. And here it's the night of Christ's death. And during the night of Christ's death, early in the wee hours, two, three in the morning, They've already came and got Jesus out of the Garden of Gethsemane and his disciples have fled and they take him to Caiaphas' house. And Now they get all the Sadducees and the Pharisees and the high priests and they put on this <clears throat> mock trial which is completely against the law and finally they say, are you the son of God or not? I am. There you have it. Ripped the cloak. And high priest said, crucify him. We've we got to crucify him. But the Jews couldn't crucify. Who was the only person that could crucify? The only people? The Romans. So they had to take him to... Pilate. Now, Pilate was the governor of Jerusalem. What did a governor do? Two, he had two, two main job descriptions. You know this. Pay the taxes and keep the peace. Matthew 27, verse 1. When morning came, all the chief priests and the elders of the people took counsel against Jesus and put him to death. And they bound him and led him away and delivered him over to Pilate, the governor. Now, Pilate he already had a couple riots. This is just history. We know that. And he already been told, if you have another riot, you're not keeping the peace. You'll no longer be governor. You'll lose your palace. You'll lose your power. You'll lose your prestige. And you will lose your popularity. So now, early in the morning, 5 o'clock, you know, 6 o'clock in the morning, they bring Jesus to Pilate. And they're screaming and hollering. And he comes out. And Pilate's like, What? We want to crucify this man. Why? Bring him in. Let me talk to him. He talks to him. What did he find wrong with Jesus? Nothing. What do you want me to do with him? Crucify. Why? Send him to, Pot. Send him to Herod. He goes to Herod. Herod's like, well, I can't get no magic show out of him. Sends him back. He's like, I can't find nothing wrong with him. Crucify. Crowd's getting restless. They're tired of this. They're ready. Riots are starting. Roman soldiers are starting to appear. I'll tell you what I'm going to do let me go flog him and beat him to the point of no life left in him. Does so, brings him out and says, here you go. This is all slept in your little ragtag Jesus. No, crucify. Okay, 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 I know what I'll do. By your own tradition, I'll let you have one of your criminals. You want Jesus or Barabbas? We want Barabbas. At this point, Pilate has a decision to make. Is he going to stand up for what he knows is right? Or is he going to cave? not to lose his popular, popularity, power, or prestige. Matthew 27, verse 24. So when Pilate saw that he was gaining nothing, but rather that a riot was beginning, he knows, I can't have another riot. If I do, I'm going to lose everything. But rather that a riot was beginning, he took water and washed his hands before the crowd, saying, I'm innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourselves. And all the people answered, his blood be on, our, be on us and our children. Then he released them Barabbas, and having scourged Jesus, delivered him to be crucified. We could give an invitation right now, and there would be several hands that would go up, as long as nobody was looking and it was in the dark. But if we asked you to stand or go to the prayer room or to meet with somebody, you sit there. Why? Because you are more worried about your popularity, your power, and your prestige through the eyes of man than you are of what Christ himself thinks of you. You're not willing to have the life change experience, but yet you say you have been through the encounter. Let me just explain something to you. When you have had an encounter with Christ, it changes your life. And if it's not changed your life, I promise you, your encounter was like that of Pilate and not of the woman at his feet, the Samaritan woman, or Zacchaeus. Probably my favorite encounter throughout the entire Bible, we find in the book of Acts. Let's go to the book of Acts. And when you make your way to the book of Acts, chapter 7, we see that Stephen is being stoned. Who was Stephen? Well, he's one of those that was picked to wait on the widows. And now, man, he's doing incredible things for, for, for Jesus to the point that they bring him in. And he, 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 they start lying about him. And he tells the entire Old Testament. And they're fine with that until he says, and Jesus is the Messiah. And what they do to Stephen? I stoned him. And you know what stoning looks like. I mean, we've, we, we've talked about that. Acts 8, verse 1. And Saul approved of his execution. 
And there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria except the apostles. Devout men buried Stephen and made great lamentation over him. But Saul was ravaging the church and entering house after house. He dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. He said, i got to stop this Jesus stuff. So he goes to the chief priest and he says, hey, can I travel to Damascus? You'll get north of this movement and knock this Jesus stuff out. Yeah. Begins to make his way up to Damascus and Christ meets him. And we see that when Christ meets him, he says, what are you doing, Saul? Why are you persecuting me? Who are you? I'm Jesus. Ananias meets Saul in town because he's now blind. The scales fall off. And what you read about Saul's conversion, conversion, his encounter, is simply amazing. Go to Acts 9. Go to Acts 9. Go to verse 26. And when he'd come to Jerusalem, sorry, 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 Acts, Acts 9, verse 20, verse 20. And immediately, what did it say? He hadn't been through any discipleship. He hadn't been through dust of glory. He hadn't, been through, he hadn't been through Bible studies. He hadn't been trained how to go out and tell the world about Jesus. He hadn't done anything. And the guy that was killing Christians, Christ showed up and appeared to him and said, you're going to change the world for me. Guys, we're the same as Saul. I want you to change the world for me. And immediately... He proclaimed Jesus in the synagogue saying, he is the son of God. He could have been killed. He is the son of God. And all who heard him were amazed and said, is not this the man who made havoc in Jerusalem of those who called upon his name? And has not he come here for the purpose to bring them bound before the chief priest? But Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who lived in Damascus by proving that Jesus was the Christ. entered Saul to change him? The Holy Spirit. And if you've had a conversion, if you've had an encounter with Christ, what's the difference in that Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit, it's the Holy Spirit that entered us? None. But we see that this woman, when she was saved, fell at his feet and just wept over the sin that she had in her life. We see the Samaritan woman that nobody would even be around. Go tell the entire city. We see this little short thief who, who came and gave back everything Twofold, fourfold if he needed. But then you see Pilate just turn his back and say, nope, I'm not willing to give up my popularity, my power, my prestige. I ain't doing it. My palace. But then you see Saul. His life was radically changed to the point we still talk about him today. I can't go from what you guys have been through. I just know. People make fun of me. April 12, 1987, at 12.05, I had an encounter with Jesus. And that next day, I began reading my Bible and studying it because I just wanted to know Jesus in a deeper level. Deb and I started giving, tithing the very next Sunday. I went to school on Monday and started telling students, hey, I met him. I started telling my athletes, I met him. I told anybody that would hold still. He is the king, and I've never got over it. How can we celebrate Jesus and never talk about him, give to him, spend time with him, is that fair, church? Yes. Have you ever encountered Christ? Yes. And if so, what does your life change look like? Yes. Last thing, I want to finish with two people who had complete, total, polar, opposite reactions to Christ. Here's, a, again, a map. And we know that Jesus spent his three years of ministry in the Galilee area, Matthew 16, he went up to Caesarea Philippi, 17, he went up to Tel Dan, 18, comes back to Capernaum, and then 19 and 20, he makes his way back down to the Jordan River on the way to Jerusalem, and he stops at where he was baptized. And this rich young ruler comes up to him and says, boy, if you don't think this sounds like an American church, what do I need to do to inherit the kingdom of God? What do I need to do to go to heaven? You know, well, exactly what is it that I need to do? And Jesus said, well, it's not that hard for you. I mean, don't be involved with sexual immorality. Don't be a murderer. Don't be, don't be. But, but then honor your mother and father. And, and he said, 
Ha! I got that. Matthew 19. Matthew 19. He said, oh, that's not a problem. I've checked those boxes. And behold, Matthew 6, 19, 16. And behold, a man came up to him saying, teacher, what, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? What do I need to do to make sure I don't go to hell? It's all about that heaven thing. Whew. And Jesus told him, man, these are things you need to do, things not to do. Oh, I got that. I got that. I got that. No, no problem. Matthew 19, verse 20. The young man said to him, oh, all these I've kept. Look how good I am. How self-righteous I am. What do I still lack? And Jesus said to him, if you would be perfect, if you'd have a radical encounter with me, this is what you need to do. Go sell what you possess and give to the poor. And then you will have treasure in heaven. Do you know through all of these encounters, this is the only one that said anything about heaven? And the only way that Jesus said that you'll encounter him to the point of actually being in heaven is when you go sell everything you have. Wow. And you'll have treasure in heaven and come follow me. And when the young man heard this, he went away sorrowful, for he had great compassion, possessions. You can see him just walking away. Did you notice Jesus didn't go, okay, hold on, hold on, hold on, <laughs> hold on. Let's talk about this. Let's barter. Just give me 70%, and then you can go to heaven. No, what did Jesus do? He let him make his decision to walk away. And Jesus said to his disciples, truly I say to you, only with difficulty will a rich person enter the kingdom of heaven. Why would he say that? Because so many of us put all of our emphasis on our money, our popularity, our power, our palaces to the point that we're not willing to give them up for an encounter with Jesus Christ. Come on, church, is that just being real? Come on, church. Hey, but we're all good, right? Last one. Take your Bibles, go to Luke. Luke 21. It is the last time that Jesus teaches in the temple. He never goes back and he never teaches again. Luke 21 verse 1 says this. Jesus looked up and he saw the rich putting their gifts into the offering box. Can't you see Jesus standing there watching all the rich church religious elite, you know, self-righteous people putting their gifts into the box. They want to get the blessings from God, you know, make sure we get the health, wealth, and prosperity. And, you know, and he said, truly, I tell you, sorry, sorry. And he saw a poor widow, verse two, put in two pennies. And he said, truly, I tell you, this poor widow has put in more than all of them. For they all contributed out of their abundance, but she, out of her poverty, put in all she had to live on. That is a radical encounter with Christ. She didn't trust people. She didn't trust her bank account. She didn't trust anything but Christ to provide what she needed in life. And Christ has now become the last thing that we turn to when we need something Versus being the first. What does your life encounter with Jesus look like? Now, don't get me wrong, please. Last night, my little four-year-old, Weston, Weston Dean, spent the night with us. And after we ate and wrestled and played, we went into the bedroom and, and, and he wanted to watch Elf on the Shelf. And so I, I laid there and watched it with him. It was actually pretty good, to be honest. I had never seen it. And we laid there and we watched it. And then I said, hey, hey. Weston, you want to talk about Jesus? Yeah. No, that's not what he said. Yep. Yep. I said, who is Jesus? Where was he born? Where did he live? What was his parents' name? Where did he ride? And we just talked about Jesus. I said, you want to pray? Yep. I just prayed over him in a great way. I got done, and this is what he said. I peeked while you were praying. <laughs> this morning... I always get up at 5 o'clock on Sundays. I got up, and he came running out, and I heard those little feet running to Big Daddy, jumped in my lap. 
And then he, he pointed in our Christmas tree. And it was an old, old elf. I don't know how long Deb's been putting that thing on the tree. And she said, he said, Big Daddy, what's that elf? I was like, uh-oh. I said, well, that was Big Daddy's elf when he was a kid. He said, have you ever touched it? I said, yep. He's real old now, so he don't fly around no more. And he's perfectly fine with that. So I want you to make sure you understand. I'm not saying that if you talk about the elf on the shelf, you're all going to die and go straight to hell. But what I am saying is, shouldn't Jesus at some point come up in our Christmas celebrations? Shouldn't we have an encounter to the point that we want to talk about him, we want to give to him, we want to teach our kids about him, we don't make everything about the world? Started with a Christmas carol. Let's end. How does the Christmas carol with Scrooge end? He had a radical life encounter. He takes little Timothy's invite and he goes to Christmas dinner. He begins to give money to charities. He begins to be the imperfect picture of what Christmas spirit should look like. And it's a movie. If we've encountered a real radical love relationship with Jesus, should we not look different to the worst rest of the world? Should we not people say during Christmas, I don't know what you got, but I want to have what you have. And his name is Jesus. Let me, let me, let me, let me read this to you. We're done. John 13, Jesus said, a new suggestion I give you. I'm hoping maybe you might do this. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Just as I've loved you. You also are to love one another. And by this, all people will know that you are my disciples. If you have love for one another. In other words, we should be the most loving people on this planet. And instead, we've made it all about, I just go to heaven and then ignore everybody else. Every eye open, every head up. Pastor, you're right. I need to make Christmas more about Jesus and celebrate it his way versus the world's way. If that's you, just raise your hand and put it right back down. All right, okay. There we go, there we go. Are you willing to make a change? Are you willing to make a change? This week, every eye open, every head up. I'm gonna ask you this week, would you look for an opportunity to love on people like Jesus did? It might be a text, it might be a card, it might be a tank of gas, it might be a phone call, it might be you writing a wrong that you've never done, it might be you paying back what you owe somebody, it might be you asking forgiveness for something. It might be you being the one to reconcile a relationship, even though they learned the wrong, but you're the ones trying to reconcile it. It might be, I don't know, but pastor, it's Christmas, and I want to share the love of Jesus more, and I want to share the way the world does it, and I'm willing to do that this week. If that's you, would you just raise your hand? Leave it up. Don't put it down. Leave it up. Would you just pray? Holy Spirit, open my eyes and allow me to see an opportunity to show the love of Jesus this week. And give me the desire and the conviction to do exactly what you lay on my heart so that people can see the love of Jesus in me and want what I have. And everybody said, let's go out this week and let's start being Jesus the way that he's commanded us to be. Pastor, I like it when you do dust of glory. It's just to kind of teach the Bible and you don't get in our face so much. You better buckle up. 2024 is going to be a different kind of year because I'm going to push you to be what God called you to be and not what the world desires you to be. I, I didn't know how to end this. If you're a first-time guest, you haven't heard about this, and so you're not caught up with us. But as the children of God, should we not want to give to God? And we're doing our end-of-the-year gift, and, and we're putting all that towards our students this year. And it's going to cost hundreds of thousands of dollars to turn that Cato's building into what we're going to turn it into for our students to use on a regular basis. And we're not going to do a loan. We're, not going, to, we're going to take what God's people give to God's house to build a better place for students to come to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ so more lives can be changed. It's up to us. So I just want you to give because you want to, not because you have to. No one stand up for me, please. Stand up for me, please. If you're in that aisle, that aisle, that aisle, that aisle. Hey, Stephen, bring it here. 
and I'm smoking what I'm selling. I'm going to give largely because I have such a large God. Deb and I believe in giving because he's gave so much to us. Now, a lot of people are going to do it online. I understand that. A lot of people have already called the office and done. This will be given. Today's offering will be given to take that building and turn it around. If you're a first-time guest, Deb and I are going to walk down to the VIP room. I'd love to shake your hand and just tell you thank you for being here and give you a gift. This Friday night is our night of worship. And I love our night of worships. Why? Because you get people who want to be here and they start worshiping and they start raising their hands and they start shouting. It's just like literally the presence of God comes down and I just get to enjoy it and love it with all of you. How many of you plan on being here Friday night? Excellent, excellent. If you don't, I'll be praying you get saved, okay? I hope you get here. No kid point. Bring your kids in here. All we're going to do is worship. I'm going to teach the Lord's Supper in a way that the Jewish people would have done it back in the first century. That's it. Oh, I hope to see you here. Now, in January, we've got a whole bunch of, of, of classes starting over because once you do have that radical encounter, you should have a desire to get deeper and, and you can see. So we, we just want you to be able to go to that next level of where you are in your walk with Christ. It's called your sanctification. And then X's and O's, our marriage retreat's coming up. What a great gift for your spouse. And, and we've already had some people say it's a little bit more this year. It is, I know, because hotels have gone up, food's gone up, and you're getting two nights in a great place, all your meals, and what I believe is great teaching, I'm only speaking once, for the marriage retreat. So, man, I'd love to have you get signed up for that. All right, Five Point, would you not agree with me? It's already been a good day. I just want you to leave this place more jacked up about changing the world for Christ, not because you come to church, but because you've had an encounter with him. Thanks for being here. Hope to see you Friday.